what is architecture? Hmm. I would say, so I'm not an architect, so I have nothing really to say what architecture is, but I can say about what I like about architecture. And it has something to do with um, a manner of thinking that is at one and the same time very abstract, but also insists on a kind of a colloquialism or on a commonsensicality. So this manner of thinking abstractly um, in architecture has a lot to do, on the one hand, I think, with terms like form and structure and module, ground, ceiling and so on. So terms that are in a, yeah, that are very difficult to define and for which it's also good that they cannot be defined. So there is a kind of a resistance in architecture to develop specialized vocabularies. So <clears throat> in many ways um, architecture works with a kind of a, an analytical reduction that is quite different from the one that we usually associate with philosophy. So it's an analytical reduction where there is, um, it's almost like in cooking, <laughs> yeah, where, you, where, you, where, you, where you condense, where you crystallize out of a plenty, a certain kind of essence. And it is not so much to be true, but to, uh, to, to, to organize our living spaces. Um, this is interesting because there is related to, uh, to this kind of analytical production reduction an interesting way of um, thinking about imagination and vision. It has something to do with uh, an imagination which is in a strange way Im impersonal, I would say. So it's almost like an objective way of imagining because it comes from forms. So an interest in, in, uh, in, in form and the abstraction that I uh, was talking about in the beginning has of course something to do with extracting forms from things, but never really in, with the idea that there is a purity to form. And that's why this resistance of organizing the very abstract to the very colloquial in one way. And that is, uh, gives a kind of a relaxedness and a generosity which I find um, very important and today again increasingly so because we have such an enormous increase of technical vocabularies. No. So there is um, in the 20th century there is an, uh, an explosion of, of dictionaries no? with the diversification of the scientific fields, with the diversification of products. There are so many new words but they mean very little because they are too precise and they are too specific. And we need to develop a kind of vernaculars with these technical words. And um, in, my, in my understanding, or that's something that I'm very fascinated in uh, with regard to architecture, that we can really learn how to do this. Um, yeah, from architecture. And then another point, this has <coughs> to do with this relation to form. So it's almost, mm, so form, form is what one sees everywhere. But in order to see it, one has to surrender to form. So it's, a, it's an interesting way of trying to achieve a kind of a mastership, certainly. But it's a mastership that, in a way, serves an objective autonomy. And this is something that I always liked in literature as well. Sometimes it's there, but it, gets, it can get very didactical, especially in, in literature now. And in, the art, in many of the arts in principle. But um, architecture somehow is very old, <laughs> so very self-confident with this kind of, uh, of, of processes. Um, and then uh, this has to, again to do with the same. There is an enormous affinity between architecture and rhetorics through this relation to form. So it's not only that the key terms in uh, all the Renaissance Tractatuses, but also in, in Vitruves, they come from the rhetoricians. And I think the reason behind it is, uh, is not just, uh, it's not just accidental or somehow historical, it has something to do with an understanding of its basic idea of stasis. So it's, there, is no, there is never really a state in, in, uh, with regard to this thinking, but 
moments of static constellations are tried to, uh, to, to expose or to, or to make happen. And that's something that rhetoric is concerned with as well. So there is a kind of an agitatedness, one could say, which is basic, a kind of a crowdy tumult. And then it's about, um, clear, yeah, it's about clearing and clarity, but again, very different from philosophy, where this would be related to some kind of uh, purity uh, or form. And that's why I think architecture is articulating. So if maybe the, the question, what is architecture? I would say it's, um, it's an art of articulation. And articulation in a rhetorical sense, so not in the sense of producing statements, reasoning arguments, being discursive so much, but of uh, placing something somewhere. So what can architecture do? Um, yeah, I would say anything <laughs> or nothing. It's a bit like with language. No? So to, to make this analogy so close then means you can do a lot, of course. But I would say it's a bit of a, almost like a sickness a little bit of our time to always ask for purpose and function. So if the basic relation to form or to what one is actually working with of course, materials, they are in a cycle, always, have also always been. And then form, if you think of it like that, too. So then the question of what can architecture do, of course, is, a, is an important one. But I would say less in the question of um, can it solve, I don't know, demographic problems or produce circumstances where people can have happy lives. So, so there is, what I mean when I say there is a kind of a sickness to our time is that we tend to forget that not everything is a question that could be socially provided. No, something like a goodness, a good life or a happy life. It doesn't depend on things that can be either provided or taken away. So there is a kind of, but this again is like this background tumult noise, no, where you try to articulate stasis. It's a kind of a it's a kind of a mastership that lives from surrendering to something and then to produce um, milieus of coexistence with potentially conflicting things. Uh, well, yeah. So, what is your architectural position? Yeah, here it's similar. I wouldn't say so much a position because position is very much with the argument. A position is very much in a constellation of conflicting, yeah, positions. But what is much more, I think, with uh, this stance in architecture is precisely a stance. So to have to have uh, to regard form with um, with respect to to, to contenance in French, this word, no, any Haltung haben in German. So and I don't mean this in a moralistic sense, not at all. It's really an ethical sense. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an ethical form of politeness that relates very much to sharing a public space. Um, mediated through forms that are neither private nor public. Yeah? So the forms are somehow the transcendental in that. So it's, uh, I, I would say, more a question of having a stance than taking a position. But then this also means that it's not really an architectural stance. So it's a stance. Yeah? So whatever one does, one has a stance. <laughs> yeah. And it's, uh, it has something to do with since it's, so its basic ideas are so abstract and in a way so simple at the same time, that it's always about everything. <laughs> so so in, in architecture, it's, a, it's, it's, it's not so much about world pictures or world models, it's just about the whole world. <laughs> and then the whole world is, of course, what is meaningful and relevant to one's own life, so it can be more comprehensive or less. But uh, I, yeah, what I find super interesting in, in, uh, in architecture, also historically, but also contemporaneity-wise, <laughs> is to, um, to read or to look at architecture in how it makes basically power structures transparent. Yeah? So architecture, I would say, is not really about being revolutionary or triggering change. It's always in the milieu. But it's so important because it makes transparent how power in particular times, in particular regions, is organized. 
And this, this transparency is, an ambig is ambiguous, yeah? because on the one hand, it makes also literally transparent how power is organized, if one cannot read it. So if one is not literate in reading architectural structures and also the structures of projects and the contexts of financing and, and all, of the, all of this, so the whole world is in every project, but it's difficult to read it. But if one can read it, then it makes it, then the transparency creates a kind of a, of a visual space where we can actually see it. And I think this is a tremendously important function today. So we tend to say, we tend to think that power is either only political and then it becomes primarily social and subjective or it is physical and then it's a question of matter. But uh, our world is organized in symbolic systems and the symbolic, the symbolicness of, of our of our of our lives, of our worlds, of our forms, produce a kind of a power which is always already there. So it's also um, in a sense it's not a question: Do I want to be with or against it? No, it it's, it's about articulating amidst, <laughs> and in a way, of course, then also giving. Um, yeah, like in rhetorics, no, there's a kind of an opportunism involved, but there's a kind of always being with in order to be subversive at the same time. And that's something that our, our, our ethics, at least in this enlightenment sense, has kind of um, given a pejorative aspect to it. But it's like diplomacy. It's existentially important. <laughs> and in, yeah, it has a lot to do with the architectural stance. So I would say it's not so, it's not so much a position, it's a stance, because it's in a way standing outside, but trying to relate to. Uh, not only trying, uh, relating to all the time, but it has a kind of a double, a double articulation almost, one that is uh, uh, realizing things directly, and another one that also goes across projects, across times, in a much larger, larger context, which is more dialogic perhaps, with, I don't know, with oneself, or with the history of architecture, or with an idea of beauty, or whatever it might be. But there, and from this uh, decouplement of two lines, there is a certain freedom and generosity in, uh, in, in, uh, yeah, in, this com in this strange combination of being super abstract, also going with power, with technology, with reformations, with, with, with all of these changes, but at the same time, keeping an autonomy uh, uh, um, yeah, to it. Yeah. What is your design method? I don't have a design method, but it's uh, so related to this um, uh, stance, which is always kind of outside. <clears throat> there is something interesting about about architecture and its relation to method, I would say, because this analogies that I'm making between language, between poetics, between between rhetorics, and so on, it's not just um, because it's my background where I'm coming from. It's also because I think architecture, if it makes basically articulations, is very concerned with what in before the modern university systems was called the trivium. No? So education of all the building arts. So all the sciences were called building arts, and we had uh, basically two, um, two por portions. One was the trivium, and it involved rhetorics and logics and uh, dialectics. So it was about the mechanism and the power of thought. And then there is the quadrivium. And the quadrivium is um, geometry, arithmetics, astronomy, and uh, music. And the quadrivium presupposes that thought has been quantified. So this is the big revolution, revelation, modernization in uh, the beginning of modernity. That the trivium becomes, in a way, secondary. So a lot of the trivium gets, we could say, you know, in, uh, encapsulated in tools, in devices, in instruments, in observation um, uh, setups and so on, in experimental setups. And this was a huge liberation from the authority structure that was organized in scholastic philosophy, but also before in the schools. And um, when, when, when today people are so interested in methods everywhere, it has a lot to do with an expectation that a certain dialogic element that is always at work in the trivium um, 
always involves relations that are not equal. Not, so in a dialogue, there is a student talking to a teacher, there is also a priest talking to, to the, the people in church. So it's a kind of a, an unequal circle or cycle which grow very, very suspect with the idea of secularized society. So we have a bit of a problem with the dialogic. But the, the thing is that if we just go for quadrivium methods, we have a shortcut between theory and technology. <laughs> so we use technology to legitimate theories, and we use theories to legitimate and establish technologies. And that, that, that creates a shortcut, which, which is um, making things tense. Yeah? So we need, if you don't, if you are moving in the, in the quadrivium without an education in the trivium, we produce trivialities. <laughs> yeah? So, so in not cultivated forms. And architecture with the articulations is with the trivium. Philosophy is too, I would say, to a large extent. And what is so interesting with regard to this question of method is that, you know, with the with the uh, with the quadrivium, what happened is that this dialogic um, perspective, this dialogic method, was somehow generalized. And then one could say, okay, we we can all speak as equals, regardless whether we have more or less to say, if we make our methods explicit, because through the methods we can then work together on everything that everybody does. And this is called discourse. <laughs> yeah, so in discourse, there is only argumentation, there is only mappings. A function is a mapping of one argument into another form. Yeah? And then this is a, a kind of a, a notion of work, much more than contemplation, which goes with, with, with the trivium. And <clears throat> this method is competing with a notion of, that in antiquity was called mathesis. Mathesis was literally means everything that pertains to learning. It's where mathematics is coming from, but it's not coextensive. <laughs> and I would say with, with method, we have a similar structure um, when we put architectonics. It's not a methodology, but it's not particular methods either. Like mathesis, it's not really didactics of mathematics, and it's not mathematics itself either, it's comprehensive. And I would say architectonic does the same with regard to methods. And then this question of uh, design methods, for me, would be falling together in uh, architectonics, which would be something methodical, <clears throat> but not something that, well, something that needs a trivium. Yeah. <laughs> and there is, um, I'm just now working on, on a a super interesting line with regard to Descartes, no, of whom we say it, it produces all this uh, empty quantification. So Descartes is not much liked today, but what he did was the opposite. <laughs> so he wrote the book Discour Dis Discourse on Method. And it is as if methods itself had reason that need guidance. Not so much that methods need to help us guide our reason. There is an instrumentality at work he describes, for example, his space of imagination that he relates to it by saying, look, the vision for everybody is like a vision for a blind man. You need a stick in order to learn to see. So there are always instruments where you can get sophisticated, more sophisticated, more sensible, more uh, differentiated, more articulate. But it's natural, and as a, as a, a, he calls it in puissance, it's not a potential, it's also not possibilities, because it's more like a kind of an energy. Um, it's, it's always already there, but a lot can be made out of it. And this, um, <clears throat> so when everybody would say, we have discourse based on method, Descartes says, let's make a discourse where we put method as a topic. And that is super subversive. <laughs> and this is a kind of a, a new way to relate to Descartes. There have been two or three books now in the last four or five years, all beginning to work this out. And that is very interesting. So we, I think, in a way, then Descartes, with this gesture, was introducing a new way of dialogic into the uh, quadrivium structure of quantification. And if we are looking for something like, um, how do we? think architectonically, you know, how, the, how then, so if, if I say it's not design methods, it's architectonics, the question still is how can we learn that? How can we, um, what is it? How can we talk about it? And I think <clears throat> it manifests more, so instead of methods, and this is also <clears throat> the way that I try to do with, with, uh, with, with students, is um, to go to exercises and to invent didactics. So, so there is something about, 
interiorizing gestures without first understanding it. And then you, you, yeah, you kind of know them viscerally and they help you to see the more you use them. And that is a different form of, a, of, a, of a learning method, I would say. It's related to the same thing, but it's, it's, in, it's explicitly including, again, a, a, trivium, a trivium aspect. So that's why I <clears throat> like to, uh, so even though I'm teaching architecture theory, I actually want to speak of literacy. It's a literacy in coding. And I would say literacy in coding is architectonics. So there is, when, when, when I said before that architectonics is competing with the notion of system, it also means, like the notion of system, no? we, it's ubiquitous, so we apply it everywhere. And we do the same with architecture in a way, but then we always feel it's just metaphorical. But my point would be, no, it's not metaphorical. What if it's not metaphorical? <laughs> so then we can make um, <clears throat> all the fields, uh, in a way, uh, we, can, we can endow it with politics again. So method is not replacing politics. That's very much the role that we are giving to methods now in education. We say if it's methodical, um, we can have discourse, but then the decisions will always be somehow an effect of a, of a self-organized system. And we need, there is no politics without responsibility structures, but it cannot be a responsibility no, like a, I don't know, like a parent asks their children to come to their common senses. This again is so nice in Descartes. He just said common sense is, um, well, he opened up good sense and common sense. So he said common sense is, is, a, is a kind of, <clears throat> where all our senses and impressions, they are kind of mixed. It's like a background sense, like a sixth sense. So it's not very precise, but it's very fundamental and it's very much shared. Like this common sense is a very old notion. But then with this emphasis on discourse on methods, there started to be many moralizations of common sense. And these were then opinions. No? They would say, we are, we are good sense. We are not just common sense. We are common sense that is for the good. <laughs> and Descartes inverted this and said, no, no, no. So we not, common sense cannot be either good or bad. It's just common. And um, <clears throat> with respect to, uh, to, to the opinions, we need uh, to have a kind of a method of, of evidence and of, of seeing things that is more than a subjective opinion. And this, I think, is why he gets so complicated with his notion of imagination. So, this, so what would be the subject of an ob objective imagination? And I think it's methods. So methods as a kind of a shared, of a shared knowledge, which becomes, which becomes no, yeah, normal, simply because everyone uses it. Not because it's good or bad, but because it's a becoming norm and standard. <clears throat> but there is reason to that, so it's not neutral. Or to put it in another way, the, the neutrality itself is an articulation of reasons. And if we begin to think like that, we have a, a way also to engage artificial intelligence now in all these uh, new contexts, um, big data streams, big data, and the bigness of data. We can relate to it, uh, not in a new paradigm which we would have to invent somehow after post-postmodern or whatever it should be, or structuralism. No, it's just always the same. <laughs> it's always a turning trivium, and then quadrivium gets innovative and, and, and more dominant, then we need a new trivium, we need a new quadrivium. And that's more or less how I see it. <laughs>